Right. Oh, lights aren't working. This is for newish students studying anatomy with us at Swansea University. Now you know that this is the entrance to the main anatomy lab and your ID card gives you access to this room. This is the main anatomy lab, you know it because we teach in here every week. Um, many of you don't remember that in the first week I told you that this lab is here for you. Uh, sure, we teach in here, but this room is set up for you to study in. This is how we all learnt anatomy. Um, partly from teachers, but largely from studying. Your ID card will get you into this room between 7 a.m. in the morning and 10 p.m. at night, and it should let you into the main building as well. Certainly if you're a medical student or a physician associate student, the applied medical science students will be starting in January. So, it's only a formative exam that's coming up, but we're 10 weeks in, so you will be wanting to spend time in here studying, right? Uh, there's another room though, if we are teaching in here, or if you would prefer to use a different room. Outside the main anatomy lab, that's the technician's office. They can help with a lot of queries. If you're studying in here, don't do any of this. Don't even take it in the room, leave it in your bag. And then this room here is the student study space. Um, I wanted to call this the anatomy study space, but they wouldn't let me use the abbreviation for some reason. In here, tell by the bottles this is a non-lab space whereas of course the labs are lab spaces we've got computers we've got models we've got whiteboards we've got space we've even got heating and light um, we've got textbooks and bits and bobs you may take anatomy labs from the main anatomy lab and bring them in here it would be great if you could put them back where you got them from at the end of your studies please um, but this is a room that you can always study in. We will never teach in here. The reason we refurbished this room is because we, we have more students than ever before. We're doing more teaching than ever before. But students need somewhere to study when they have time to study. So this is that room. If you see us teaching the other rooms, usually the doors will be open anyway. It's noisy, practical sessions, right? Feel free to come in and out. Um, you shouldn't be disturbing anybody. If you are worried, just ask. But get in the labs and study. The reason we have all these plastic models is for you to study anatomy with, and the other resources too. All right. You probably know by now that my office is just down the corridor. Chris is next to me, as is Carpa Gamma Marcy. Um, if you're in the anatomy lab and you have questions about anatomy, feel free to come and ask us questions. We are probably going to be more interested by whatever question you have and answering it than in whatever it is we're doing. Not all the time, but hey, we love seeing students. We love answering your questions. So come and badger your favorite anatomist. I'm not judging you, pick whoever you like. And the other rule is that if you're in the anatomy lab and an anatomist wanders in, they are fair game. You can ask them anything you want about anything at that point. That's the game we play, all right? Trying to get chat, <laughs> trying to get chat GPT to write a lecture on the evolution and the embryology of the nervous system. It is doing the most appalling job. The nervous system has evolved over millions of years in animals. The first nervous systems were simple and consisted of a few cells. Over time, the nervous system of animals became more complex. Different animals have different types of nervous systems. It's like, it's like you're giving a viber to a student. It doesn't know the subject matter. They're just coming up with whatever. Um, animals have different nervous systems and some nervous systems are more complex than others and they have been around for a very long time. 
<laughs> I'm not having a job for a while. Uh, I hope my lecture's better than this after I've, <laughs> after I've said this. I'm home now. It's the weekend. Work continues on the weekend. Um, kind of left you hanging there. Would you like to know the evolution of the nervous system or theory of? Okay, the reason that ChatGPT, a large language model like that, struggles to describe it. So ChatGPT's description was basically over millions of years, the nervous system started off as something simple and became more complex and, you know, really generic stuff. Um, and the reason for that is that, well, it's not really the sort of thing that's written down clearly in lots of places on the internet that it can pull together and create something coherent from, right? Not like neuroembryology. So neurorelation is well understood. It's, it's written down in loads of places. It can describe neurorelation really well, which is great. The problem with the evolution of the nervous system, um, so it's still a big argument in science about what happened, because that's what scientists do best, right? They argue. Um, the nervous system evolved or started to evolve a really, really long time ago. The fossil record is incomplete and the nervous system evolved in soft, squishy animals that hadn't evolved bones yet. So those that do, well, the, you know, there isn't really much evidence of them in the fossil records. So trying to glean what happened is nigh on impossible. Really, we need a time machine to be able to go back and have a look at all this stuff. Then we can be sure. But the next best method is to look at animals that still exist now that branched off from the animal tree a really, really long time ago, like sea sponges and jellyfish, right? The first organisms were single cell organisms. Um, it's a, they don't need a nervous system, you know, they have, they'll developed uh, sensors on the surface which will interact with things as they float around or waft around in the world and they get nutrients and they divide and reproduce, right? Then came multicellular organisms and then when multicellular organisms started to get to a certain size, it's likely that there would have been a survival advantage and a, re a reproductive advantage to those cells being able to work in an organized fashion. Look at the sea sponge. So the sea sponge still exists now, but it branched off the animal tree a really, 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 really long time ago. And what we see in sea sponges is, um, we don't see the structures that we see in most animals. We see uh, like, uh, like tubes and water can be pulled through those tubes. So a sea sponge sits in the sea, gets its nutrients from whatever floats past it. If it could evolve to organize the cells which have cilia or flagella on them to all contract in a coordinated manner, they could pull the water across the surfaces of their cells, increasing the surface area, increasing the chance of nutrients in the water being absorbed, all that sort of thing, right? And that's what we see in sea sponges. But the weird thing is, we see nitric oxide, we see what, GABA, uh, we see aspart uh, aspart aspartate, aspart we see some of the same signals in sea sponges that we see in complex animals like humans. <laughs> Little bit later, we see things like jellyfish. So probably uh, jellyfish evolved. Their big advantage is unlike the sea sponge, they're not anchored and the sea and the nutrients and stuff waft over them, jellyfish can move around. So the next step then is having muscle cells and being able to move, being able to get those cells to contract in a coordinated fashion so they can propel themselves around the seas. Couple that to sensors, to light, temperature, chemical cues that indicate the nutrients that are useful to your survival or reproduction or in that direction. Really, you're not making a very complicated circuit now between those sensors and that, that motor apparatus to increase the survival and reproductive advantages of that animal in propelling itself around the sea. My Hoover, my robot Hoover that wanders around my room picking up dirt is probably, well, it's definitely no more complex than that, but it's, you know, similar purpose, right? Sensors and, yeah? So jellyfish have neurons. Now, if you think about neurons, um, and you think about the sea sponge, in the sea sponge you had a cell that could release a signal that would then 
attached to a receptor on an adjacent cell. But those signals are just diffusing through the animal, right? Um, you take that cell, and then that cell gets a really, really long process and just releases the signal from the end of that process onto the receptors of another cell. Now you've got a neuron, you've got a cell body and the axon, you've got a synapse. And um, like the action potential, where did that come from? Well, we see um, sodium channels and calcium channels in single-celled organisms. So it seems like, again, a natural evolution of something that already existed. So jellyfish have neurons. And then we see the development of the gastrointestinal tract, the gut tube. So later on in evolution, so we're a little bit further up the animal tree, now we see lots of animals that develop a gut tube, and this seems to confer a huge survival and reproductive advantage. Um, and also, when you've got a tube, so basically you've got, the animal has a mouth at one end, has an anus at the other end, has a tube running through it, and now it can send nutrients through the inside of its body and absorb those nutrients. Um, but now you've got a head end, and a tail end, you've got a left and a right, you've got a dorsal and a ventral, you've got organised, you've got bilateral animals. This, I mean, this seems to have served such a survival advantage that most animals have this now. But also, if you've got a head end, you pack your sensory apparatus at the head end, which drives the organism towards light, warmth, nutrients, the stuff goes through and out the other end. So now you start to, you've really started to get neural networks, right? You've got sensors at one end, muscles through the body to organize, all that sort of stuff. And jellyfish and other animals, we see like neural rings. Uh, we see a ring with rays coming off it. We see rods forming like a dorsal rod and a ventral rod or, or lateral rods. And some animals only have a dorsal rod and some have a ventral rod. So the argument is, well, did all of these neural patterns, nervous system patterns, arise in a single animal and then vary from there, or did they arise independently? Um, for example, humans have just got a dorsal rod, right? The spinal cord in the brain is a dorsal is a dorsal rod. Um, might sound mad that such complexity evolves in separately, but this is what happened with the eye. Um, the eye not only seems like something that probably shouldn't have evolved through chance, but in fact it evolved many times through chance because having vision on this planet confers such a survival advantage that it evolved many times and those animals survived and persisted to today. Anyway, we're getting off topic again. The eye is still nervous system, but in a nutshell, that is probably, that's how I would describe the evolution of the nervous system given what we understand. There is a lot more detail, there's a lot of argument. Every time you find new things in the fossils, everything changes, you know, as you look at animals. It, it, this is like very not settled science, which is why it's not written down clearly. And I, I don't know how much it's taught to people. Like this is going to be a brief part of my um, lecture on Tuesday. I'm also going to talk about decussation, you know, how the nerves cross over because that's really cool and that's got some interesting evolutionary bits and bobs. But do you see why a large language model has a has difficulty in pulling that sort of information together and creating? like a detailed synopsis or a detailed script for a lecture. It's um, it's just not the sort of thing that's written down and it, and it changes anyway. Any excuse to talk about the evolution of the nervous system and neurulation stuff, right? Um, but yeah, decussation, fish and lizards, that's for another day. Also, another thought, given... So I made my 801st video last week for YouTube. Given that I've got 800 videos, seven years worth of stuff, and more than that on the internet, how long before you could recreate, actually you could probably do it now, couldn't you? But how long before you could recreate me from the stuff I put on the internet so that I can uh, like live forever in the machine and forever answer anatomy questions? <laughs> I could probably, if I make a start on that, I might make myself redundant though. <laughs>